Good morning, Brandon First Methodist. We are so excited to see you guys. Everybody see the leprechaun say, yeah. Sorry, I told Josh I was going to do that. Uh, we're so pumped to have you guys here this morning on this rainy, nasty March 17th. If you're joining us from home, thank you. Uh, we're glad to have you all here as well. But uh, we're going to get started in worship this morning with an old school favorite of mine. Uh, so if everybody will get on your feet, uh, we're going to get started this morning. There are emotions to this song. Can we say, yes, Lord? Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. All right, we're good. Start real quiet, you guys ready? Can y'all tell my youth minister? Let's go. We're singing, yes, Lord, yes, Lord, yes, yes, Lord, yes, Lord, yes, Lord, yes, yes, Lord, yes, Lord, yes, Lord, yes, yes, Lord, amen. Sing, yes, Lord, yes, Lord, yes, yes, Lord, yes, Lord, yes, Lord, yes, yes, Lord. Yes, Lord, yes, Lord, yes, yes, Lord, amen. Well, I'm trading my sorrow. Well, I'm trading my shame, yeah. I'm laying them down for the joy of the Lord. Well, I'm trading my sickness. Esteban was playing those drums so good, it caught fire in here. It's amazing. <laughs> you guys can be seated. Welcome to worship. Welcome to Brandon First Methodist. As Matthew, uh, Matthew uh, welcomed you earlier. Those of you who are joining us online today, it's so good to be here on this spring break Sunday 
I uh, hope you are having a wonderful time, as am I, and uh, I'm loving seeing all the green, too. This is one of the many times, well, one of the only times, I should say, that I can wear my master's shirt. It's <laughs> fully green, so uh, any excuse for me to do that today. Uh, so it's good to see you. Hey, we have some buckets in the very back on the uh, ends of the rows. If you wouldn't mind grabbing those buckets, if you're just near one, and passing them up your perspective row, uh, we're going to take up our offering during this time. And if you're new with us, there's a little white card around you as well. If you'll fill that out and drop it in the bucket, you can. Uh, we'd love to connect with you. Speaking of that, we're having an event called Coffee with the Pastors on March 24th. That's next Sunday, 930 to 1030, just before the service in the parlor. And we are going to just connect with all of those who might consider themselves new or newer or just want to know a little bit more about our church. So we'd love for you to come be part of that if you're watching online and we'll be in town that week. We'd love for you to connect. Uh, you can scan the QR code or go on brandonfirstmethodist.org and register for that event. So looking forward to meeting some new people on that day. Also, that day begins Holy Week. So we are fast approaching Easter, and we are so excited for all the things and ways that we can come together and worship. Uh, starting with Palm Sunday, that's next week. We're going to have our kids coming in with the palms and the traditional way. It's going to be really cool. And then on Thursday, uh, we have a Holy Thursday service in the sanctuary at 7 o'clock uh, that night in the sanctuary. And then on Friday, Good Friday, we have a night of worship here in this room. Now, listen, uh, uh, we love the people who came to the, our night of worship last year, but it didn't necessarily represent the folks who come to this service. So we want you to come to this service. This will be a night of worship with uh, contemporary music and all the ways that we worship here. Uh, and it's just a time in which we can come and sing and just kind of pour out our hearts to God in this time. What better night and what better day to do that on the night that Jesus gave himself up for us. So we want to, to invite you to come and be part of that. On, at 6 o'clock if you're in town and able on uh, Good Friday, March 29th. And then Saturday is the, the, the big day, uh, super fun day uh, for Easter. The in between Good Friday and uh, Easter Sunday, uh, we'll have an Easter egg hunt for our kids at 1030 that morning. Before that, we'll be decorating our living cross, but uh, 1030 for our Easter egg hunt. And then right after our Easter egg hunt, we have a gumbo cooking so we're excited about that it says down in the yes that's right uh and the, the cooks are in the building so uh, no pressure uh i won't say who it is but uh you know who it is all right just look around uh it says it's in the lower parking lot but i have named that place what wesley he, he can't even say it he, he refused it's called the bowl that's where it is so uh, you know if you've been down there it looks like a bowl so that's we're gonna have uh, we're gonna have gumbo in the bowl with bowls of gumbo. So uh, come and be part of that on the 30th uh, at 11 o'clock. And then Easter Sunday, March uh, 31st, uh, we have a sunrise service. If you're coming to that, bring a lawn, ch lawn chair, our 830 and 1045 traditional services. And then modern that day will be at 945. Y'all say 945? 945. You, if you normally come for Sunday school, you won't be late. But uh, you, you know, uh, if not, come at, during that time, please. So 945 will be right here in worship. Uh, that is all of our announcements we have. Oh, wait, there's one more coming up way, way off. Well, it's not that way off, but we're really excited for uh, scuba, uh, uh, doing friendship, diving into friendship with God. Uh, VBS, uh, June 23rd through 27, you can register today. We're uh, grateful and excited for all the kids we're going to have a part of that. Uh, let's uh, let's take just a minute, stand up, let's say hello to somebody around us. We're going to keep on singing in just a second. Happy St. Pat's Day. Christ is my firm foundation, the rock on which I stand, when everything around me is shaken. Yeah. 
got nothing new how could I express all my gratitude 
I could sing these songs as I often do, but every song must end, and you never do. So I throw up my hands, praise you again and again, cause all that I have is a heart. I know it's not much, but I've nothing else fit for a king, except for a heart singing hallelujah, hallelujah. I've got one response. I've got just one. With my arms stretched wide, I will worship you. So I throw up my hands, praise you again and again. It's all that I. Don't you get shy, lift up your song. Cause you've got a lion inside of those lungs. Get up and praise the Lord. So come on, my soul. Oh, don't you get shy, me lift up your song. Cause you've got a lion inside of those lungs. Get up and praise the Lord. Oh, come on, my soul. Oh, don't you get shy on me. Lift up your soul. Cause you've got a lion inside of those lungs. So get up and praise the Lord. Oh, I throw up my hands. Praise you again and again. It's all that I All that I have is a hallelujah, hallelujah. And I know it's not much, but I have nothing else fit for a king, except for a heart singing hallelujah, hallelujah. Worthy of every song we could ever sing. Worthy of all the praise we could ever bring. Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe. We live for you.
Jesus, the name above every other name. Jesus, the only one who could ever save. Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe. We live for you. God, we live for you. the only one who could ever sing. Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe. We live for you.
Y'all can have a seat, and uh, we're going to dismiss our kids to Children's Church right now. So y'all going to meet Miss Paige in the back. Today is St. Patrick's Day. I just love this. You know what all, a day it is also? It's a day after Josh's birthday. <laughs> Everybody say, happy birthday, Josh. Happy birthday, Josh. <laughs> Josh got a, a present this, uh, um, during the season. Um, I don't know if this is going to go up there. We good? I, I heard Josh cried when he got this. <laughs> And uh, it's just so beautiful. I just love this. And, and I thought I'd just use this as a beginning picture. This is Josh and Nora, you know, lie on the trampoline. It was a picture they had. And, and uh, I think Kristen, you know, awesome, awesome, you know, doing this for a, a birthday. But what a picture of, and, and I look at this, and, you know, like in any art, you're like identifying the glory of God, you know, identifying God, God's showing up. Anyway, I just thought I'd, I'd do that. And so, happy birthday, Josh. Everybody say happy birthday, Josh. <laughs> and then, as far as St. Patrick's Day goes, there is a prayer, and if you ever get a chance, look this up, called the Breast, Breastplate Prayer of St. Patrick. I actually prayed a portion of that this morning in the early service, and there's a portion of this prayer that says this. It says, it just has this whole movement of saying, Christ in me, Christ above me, Christ around me, Christ to my left. Christ to my right, Christ in everyone who thinks about me, Christ in everyone who, <coughs> who watches me. You know, I mean, and it, and it just kind of talks about how Christ is all around us and in us, and this is how we live, and we point to God, and we point to Christ. And then it says, and this is the Shema, it's what you teach your children and your children's children, and it is in Deuteronomy chapter 6. As God said to them, he says, write them on the gates of your cities, write them on the doorposts of your house, talk about it as you go on your way. And you, know, you can see as you're going in your car, driving your kids here and there, just talk about it. Just point to God because we want Christ to be around us in every way. And so as we begin today, we're going to we'll continue this scene of altars. I love this movement as we move in of all these different altars. And we're going to be talking about this through the, um, through the story of Gideon in Judges chapter 6. But as we do, I want to just say a quick prayer. Let's pray. <laughs> Lord, open our hearts and minds by the power of your Holy Spirit. That as the scriptures have been read and your word is proclaimed, we might hear with joy what you have to say to us today. And may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in your sight. O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. I want to set up the story, and then I'm going to read a portion of this in, in Judges chapter 6, and then kind of tell you the rest of that story. And then we're going to look at this story and learn a little bit about altars, because today there are three successive altars that happen right in a row. And those altars, we learn a little bit, not just about our lives, but we also learn about how God alters our life. Which, hence, our series, Altars. <clears throat> God wants to transform you. He wants to alter your life. He wants to change your life. And there is a process for that to happen. And we find in the scriptures stories that give us um, that gives us over and over again processes that people that go through in order to find their life changed. But you see, this wasn't the case at the beginning of the book of Judges. At this time, <clears throat> they didn't have a ruler, a specific ruler in Israel. God was their ruler. I mean, God was the one that literally ruled them. They didn't have a king. Other nations had kings, but they didn't have a king. They put their trust in God. But the problem was they didn't do it so well. And so God would send, at this point in time, they had 
different people that would lead, that, would, that people would come to in order to do, offer to settle their disputes and all of that, and God would help that person. So they had a leader, if you will, to some extent in Israel, but they were more like a prophet or, or a judge, and we often refer to them as judges. But here's the iteration that happens from the very beginning of Judges all the way to Judges, uh, Judges chapter 6 in the story of Gideon. It says that the people of God, they tended to go their own way, and, and it says specifically, they did evil in the sight of God, and God gave them into the hands of whoever their oppressors were, some people that were around them at the time, because they did evil, and they didn't follow God. They didn't follow what God told them to do, and then God gave them into evil. And for a period of time, might have been seven years, eight years, 12 years, the people were in oppression and difficulty. And they got to a point where they had it up to here with themselves, really. They had it up to here, and it says they cried out to the Lord in their affliction. Now, the same thing goes on in almost every chapter as you go through. And by, by the way, pretty much throughout the whole Old Testament and even into the New Testament, it's this constant cycle where people are, try, are doing it their own way. There's this downward spiral. It's just things go out of why, you know, and, and they're their own enemy, right? And they finally get to the point where I've had enough. And I often refer to this as the Popeye moment. I mean, a lot of you, you're too old to remember Popeye the Sailor Man, you know. But remember Popeye and olive oil, you know, she would come, you know, she would be in trouble and Popeye would, you know, and he's all bound up and he'd get to the point where he just, he says, and it, this, this statement that many people in that generation, like, he goes, I can't stand it, I can't stand it no more. And then somehow he reaches in his pocket, pulls out spinach, you know, pops it open, you know, eats it and then it's, Boom, boom, you know, and then he saves olive oil, you know. And I love this. I mean, every, every time it goes through this. But, you know, this is life. Like, we get to this point where we're our own enemy, and we get to the point where we, we, uh, we're oppressed. Things around us, they, they're not going right, and we cry out to the Lord in our distress. And what happens every chapter in Judges is God answers them by sending them a deliverer. A deliverer, someone who would come and deliver them from their enemies. And we love these stories. We read them, we're like, yeah, go, you know, it's like the Popeye moment. And, you know, they delivered from the hands of their enemies. And then it says they have peace for like 40 years. You know, more than once in the first few chapters it says 40 years. And whether or not 40 is exactly 40, we see this throughout the scriptures, but 40 is an expression of a complete time, a full time, a time that God, you know, reigns in their lives. And so a long time. So they had a shorter time of oppression. They cried to the Lord. God sends them a deliverer, and they have peace in the land. But what happens? Everything's going well. And all of a sudden, they decide to do things on their own, you know, and it starts going down again, and they decide to do that. And it says, and, the, and then they wind up doing evil in the sight of the Lord, and God gives them into the hands of their enemies, right? I mean, I love that, you know, God knows what's going to kind of turn them around. It's like, look, if you can, if you can suffer enough, you're going to turn and cry, to, cry, to, cry out to me. And finally, it comes to the point where God just lets them be because God's been helping them all along. And I'm like, if you want to do it on your own, God's like, okay, here, here, let me show you what happens when you do it on your own. And they do it on their own. Finally, they cry out to the Lord, and God sends a deliverer. Well, this happened a num number of times all the way up to Judges chapter 6. And Judges 6 is a little bit different because the oppression is much, much worse. And this is what happens. I mean, you go through enough iterations like this in your life. The next time it comes around, it's worse than it was last time. Because, you know, I mean, things just get, you know, it, it's like the spiral is faster, right? And you, you just go, go down e even quicker. And so it comes to this point, and right at the beginning it says, the Israelites, and here's the exact words in chapter 6, just like everyone, the Israelites did evil in the eyes of the Lord, and for seven years he gave in them into the hands of the Midianites. Because the power of the Midianites was so oppressive, by the way, it goes into more detail here than any other time up to this point. So he goes into detail, and it says they were so oppressive. I mean, this is like the worst of the worst. The Israelites prepared shelters for themselves, in mountain clefts, caves, and strongholds. Like they found places to hide. And it says, whenever the Israelites planted their crops, the Midianites, Amalekites, and other eastern people invaded the country. They camped in the land and ruined the crops all the way to Gaza and did not spare a living thing for Israel, neither sheep or cattle or donkeys. They devastated the land. They wiped it out. I mean, it was about the worst circumstance. And so it says that, you know, the Midianites were so impoverished 
so impoverished the, at the Israelites that they cried out to the Lord for help. They did it again. They cried out to the Lord. And then it says here, then when the Israelites cried out to the Lord because of Midian, he sent them a, well, he didn't send them a deliverer this time. He sends them a prophet. He's like, all right, we're going to take a little break here. I'm going to send you a prophet who's going to tell you a few things. And here's what the prophet says. So, and he says, and, and this is what the Lord said, the Lord God of Israel says. I brought you up out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. I rescued you from the hand of the Egyptians, and I delivered you from the hand of the oppressors. I drove them out before you and gave you their land. I said to you, I am the Lord your God. Do not worship the gods of the Amorites in whose land you live. But you have not listened to me. Wow. You know, so he sends them a prophet now, and he's like, all right, you know, now God's like, we got to have a word. We got to have a come to Jesus meeting before Jesus ever came. You know, we got to have a come to Jesus meeting, and we're going to talk about this a little bit. You've not been listening to me. The reason why this is so bad, the reason why it's getting worse and worse, is because you keep relying on yourself. You keep relying on you. You keep turning back, thinking somehow that your decisions are better than my plans for you. Somehow what you decide is even better than that. And it just gets worse and it worse. And so now it picks up with the story of Gideon. It says, The angel of the Lord came and sat down under the oak of Ophrah that belonged to Joash, where, Gideon, where his son Gideon was threshing wheat in a wine press to keep it from the Midianites. He's so afraid and so scared that he's threshing wheat inside a wine press <laughs> because he knows that, like we just have the, a minimum amount of of anything to eat, anything like that. And here they are, <clears throat> you know, he's threshing wheat. When the angel of the Lord appeared to Gideon, he said, the Lord is with you, mighty warrior. Wow. I mean, he doesn't know who this guy is, by the way, at this point. But some guy shows up while he's threshing wheat, and he just simply says to you, the Lord is with you, mighty warrior. Now, that's a, maybe a somewhat common greeting of those who know God, you know, the Lord is with you. But then he says, mighty warrior. He's probably a little bit confused for a second, like, why are you calling me a warrior? And his response is very simple. He says, pardon me, Lord. Or, pardon me, sir. Gideon replied, but if the Lord is with us, why has all this happened to us? Where are all the wonders that our ancestors told us about when they, when they said, did not the Lord bring us up out of Egypt? But now the Lord has abandoned us and given us into the hand of Midian. This is what happens when we keep doing things on our own and we keep going through these iterations of, yeah, God saves us, he delivers us, and then we do it on our own, and then we fall into this difficult situation. We cry out to the Lord, God saves us, sends a deliver. Uh, we do it again, and we keep doing this, and we start to create our own belief systems about ourselves, about God. God, he's, he's not a faithful God. This just keeps happening over and over again. God, I can't, I can't put my trust in God. God, you say you want it, you're with me, but how can I really trust that? This keeps happening. And we have a skewed understanding of our world. We have a skewed understanding of ourselves. And we have a skewed understanding of God. And this is what happens when we keep going through these iterations in our lives, when we trust in ourselves and trust on who we are. So Gideon is at this point where he doesn't, he doesn't really have a trust. He believes that God has abandoned him. Believes that God is not with him. And I just want to ask, has there been a time, or maybe there's even a time now, where you have felt like God has abandoned you? And I just want you to know that you're not alone. I'm not saying it's your fault. I'm not, you know, I mean, we're saying, like, yeah, there's a process of going down. There's a process of going up. But we all, all of us get to this point where we just don't really know that God is with us. And we need that encouragement. We need that understanding. We need that knowledge. We really need that experience. We need to know that God is with us. God in his grace keeps showing us and revealing that to us. Remember, um, Jacob and we talked about Jacob a few weeks ago. Jacob, and he says, surely the presence of the Lord is in this place, and I did not know it. And we sing songs like that. Surely the presence of the Lord is in this place. 
He didn't know it. He didn't understand it. Jacob had a skewed understanding of God because of his manipulative behavior throughout his life and the way that he lived. He was trusting in himself. He was trying to make it work on his own. And so were all these Israelites at this point, including Gideon. And so Gideon comes to this point where he hears these words, and he says, uh, the Lord responds to him after he says, but now the Lord has abandoned us and given us into the hands of Midian. The Lord turned to him and said, and I love this. You know, it says the angel of the Lord and the Lord is kind of mixing. And in this story, we get the impression that God has shown up. Same thing, we get this impression when God shows up with Abraham and when God shows up with Jacob in that same story, you know, that story with Jacob we just mentioned. And, and here, I mean, the Lord turns to him and says, go in the strength you have and save Israel out of Midian's hand. Am I not sending you? And now he tells him, like, I, he has a purpose. He already calls him mighty warrior. And now, he's, now he says, go, and I'm going to use you to deliver Israel. Again, <laughs> he's not ready for this. He doesn't believe about himself that he's anything or believe that he can do it. He doesn't believe that God is with him. He believes that God has abandoned him. He believes that um, what's going on around him is just going to happen. And maybe you have certain beliefs that have skewed your understanding of the world, yourself, and of God. And here he, he says this. And then God says this to him. He says, am I not sending you? And his response is, pardon me, sir, Gideon replied, but how can I save Israel? I, my clan is the weakest in Manasseh, and I am the least in my family. Like, I'm the lowest of low. This is, by the way, not his true state, really. It's what he believed about himself. It's what he believed about his family. It's what he believed about what he was a part of because of, again, their experience of not trusting God in their lives. And so what happens next is, is very, very interesting because the Lord answers him and says this, I will be with you. Now you notice up to this point, he's talking. He doesn't really know who this guy is. But now at this point, he doesn't just say, go and do this and you will save Israel, go, you know, and, and who he is. Now the Lord turns and says, I will be with you. Now Gideon is thinking, who is this guy? Who is he who's talking to me? I will be with you, and you will strike down all the Midianites and leaving none alive. Gideon then replies this, if now I have found favor in your eyes, give me a sign that it is really you talking to me. Please do not go away until I come back and bring my offering and set it before you. This is altar number one. There's three altars that happen. There's altar number one. And what, in this altar number one, what Gideon is doing, he's testing. He's, he's trying to find out, is God really faithful? So what does he do? He goes and he prepares. It, it says specifically what he prepares. So Gideon went inside. Well, he says to him, well, the Lord said, I will wait until you return. So Gideon went inside, prepared a young goat, and from an ephah of flour, he made bread without yeast. Now, you just have to know this equation right here because having a goat is something that normally people would use for a sacrifice. An ephah of flour is also something. And by the way, that's a lot of flour. In fact, you could make many, many loaves of bread by this. And why is he used an ephah of flour? Many scholars would think, well, the reason he did this was out of respect and, and the honor of the largeness of who it is that sits before you that you're putting, even though it seems like he's just serving one person and maybe you give him a couple of slices of bread, but he's bringing him like 30 loaves of bread, you know, so a whole ephah, you know, of flour. But besides that, he didn't have an ephah, you understand. The Midianites have destroyed everything. They have nothing. This is a sacrifice. This cost him something. I mean, cost him a huge amount. And so he says, here, let me bring you an offering. And I don't think Gideon knew what was going to happen, but he says, show me a sign. Show me a sign that God is with you. And maybe this is where you are. <laughs> it's all right. It's all right. In fact, the whole Old Testament ends this way. Where God says to the people, he says, they were not following him. Same iteration. It goes into the New Testament. This same iteration happens because the people weren't yet altered. I mean, truly changed and transformed their life. And God says to them, put me to the test, says the Lord. If you will bring your offering, 
you know, it costs you something. And we're going to talk about that. I'm going to talk about that next week about David. And um, as David says, I will not give to God. That which cost me nothing when he brings an offering to, to an altar. And, and so at the end, you know, God says, if you will bring in your offering, put me to the test, says the Lord. If I will not open up the windows of heaven for you and pour out a blessing so great that you cannot contain it. This is, the, this is the, the process of moving uphill, of moving into God's, uh, God's being with God in your life, knowing that God is with you, trusting God in, in your life, watching your purpose fall out in your life. And what he does is he brings a costly offering, and he just brings it to this God who says he's going to be with him, and he's like, maybe this is the, you know, I don't know who this is, you know, and just to see what happens. So he brings it to him. And the Lord says, put it on this rock. So he puts, the, he puts the goat on the rock and the broth that he brings with it. He says, pour the broth over it. And then he, said, and then he, puts, the, he puts the cakes, you know, this unleavened bread. By the way, it had to be unleavened if you read this in Leviticus. And, the, you know, and there's a lot of reasons for that and what, what it really means about sin being taken away in our life and not growing. And he, so he puts it all on the rock. And then the Lord takes his staff, this guy that's just there, he doesn't know, touches it. And it says fire comes out from the rock and consumes the whole offering. Altar number one is the altar that God makes in your life. You may have nothing to give, nothing, you know, that you can even, like, you don't even have, know how to make an altar. You don't even know how to do this thing of your life being changed and transformed. But here's what you do. Just you take a small step, just one small step. Take something that costs you something. And give it to God. Give God something that costs you something. Now I want to just give you maybe a quick little definition. Uh, just a re-up on definition of a sacrifice and surrender. What these two things are. Sacrifice and surrender. Because we often, I don't say we get them mixed up, but we use them interchangeably in certain ways. And when we say a sacrifice, a sacrifice is something you give that costs you something. Right? Right? That's what sacrifice is a costly act of giving, and I'll say it's an act of worship. You cannot worship, by the way, unless you sacrifice. Worship is sacrifice. Yeah, you know, we say a sacrifice of praise, sacrifice, whatever you call it. Worship, in order for it to be worship, it has to cost you something. I want you to hear that. We, we in our day, we think of worship as, re as receiving something. You are not the one being worshipped. I just want you to know that. You don't come here in order to say, you know, God's like, oh, like, you're so wonderful, you're so great. That's, we come here to lay our life down on the altar, to say, God, I give you myself. And we talked about this as being all in a few weeks ago. I give you, I lay my life, but we have to give something to God. And I want to challenge you in your life. If you want your life to start moving up instead of down, if you want to be altered, if you want the change that God wants to make in you, which is the change toward God's character, and I always come back to this, the fruit of the Spirit, if you want love and joy and peace in your life, I mean, specifically these, and they all, the rest of them fall out from there. And, you know, and kindness and goodness and faithfulness and gentleness, self-control. I think I forgot patience because we all need patience, right? You know, and I mean, if you want this in your life, if you want to find that, you've got to ha give something to God that costs you something. You have to do it because that's what worship is. Worship, it costs you. When it's raining outside, run to worship, you know? You know, I mean, if it's snowing and it's three feet deep, do everything you can to come and lay yourself before God. Because no matter what the case is, you've got to do it. Because when you're going to go from there, if you sacrifice, what God does is God makes, God makes the altar for you. And I love that. He makes the altar for you. Now, after this happens, let's just move quickly because we, we don't have much time. So, we, you know, after this, he moves right to, from this altar and he responds like, it's the Lord. You know, I mean, I saw the angel of the Lord. I'm going to die, right? You know, I mean, he's the, like in God's presence. And then the Lord, by the way, when, the, when, he, when he touches and the, it consumes the offering, it says the Lord disappeared. The Lord was gone. And 
then he, he cries out like he's desperate, like, I'm going to die. And then it says, the Lord said to him. Well, how did God say to him if he wasn't there? We notice that there's a movement that happens here. Now, now he knows the Lord. And it says that when you go into the New Testament, Jesus teaches us, those who are, are part of me, they know my voice. And it, start, it moves from, I don't know God, I, I think God has abandoned me, I believe God has abandoned me, he's not with me, to it moves to, now I'm hearing him. Now I know his voice. I'm hearing what he's saying to me. And now Gideon, in this place, it says, um, the Lord answers him. You know, he says, uh, I will be with you and will strike down the Midianites. Um, so now Gideon, you know, so Gideon prepares all of this, right? And God shows up and the Lord says to him, peace, do not be afraid. Do not be afraid. Peace. So now Gideon responds after God sets up this, you know, creates this altar, Gideon responds and he sets up an altar to the Lord, all on his own. And he sets up an altar and he calls the place, the Lord is peace. The Lord is peace. It may be the first time in his life, or the first time in a long time, so we know that Gideon had any peace in his life. I mean, they were in such deep oppression, deep oppression, that all of a sudden now, he starts to sense peace from God. This reminds me of a story of, of Peter. Um, you know the story of Peter when he, um, he walks on water? Well, without even going to that, they're, they're out on the boat, all the disciples, and a storm comes up. This happens more than once. But in this story in Matthew chapter 14, it's an incredible story because they just fed the 5,000. You think these guys are on top of the world. And Jesus sends them in the boat to go, to go across you know, the sea while he dismisses the crowd. So they leave, he dismisses the crowds, and then he goes all by himself to pray. And it says the sun set and a storm started. Now, I, I, I don't think until more recently I realized how long the storm went on because it says the storm started. And then it says later after that, as the night go, in the fourth watch of the night, which was approximately three to six in the morning, Jesus starts, shows up walking on the water. That means they were in this storm, fighting this storm from sunset all the way to like 3 to 6 in the morning. I mean, these guys are frightened, fearful. And on top of that, you know, they have in this area, they believe, you know, people that died, that like there's the ghosts of other people that are around. So they see this guy walking on the water and they're like, they were terrified. The words that are used to translate this are unbelievable. I mean, it's like they're going to they're gonna die, literally die of fear. You know, they're terrified. Jesus walks on the water, and he says, right in the middle of this, he says almost three things. He says, take courage. It is I. Do not be afraid. Take courage. It is I. Do not be afraid. And in the, in the, um, in the original language, in that particular story, um, and this is often done as like a, a peak, that the, the, the very, the word, it is I, is the exactly in the middle. I mean, the same number of words before it, same number of words after it. It is I. Because this is the point. This is the point. God is with you. It is I. And when we offer a, a, you know altar to God, what we discover is three things. We discover that God gives us courage. We discover God is with us. And we discover we don't ever need to be afraid. And by the way, these are the three things that are told to Moses, to Joshua, and it goes on and on. Because they knew this in history. Remember Joshua 1.9? It, it says, be, be strong and courageous. Be not frightened, neither be dismayed, for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. And Jesus said this in a short way. Take courage. It is I. Do not be afraid. And this is what Gideon is now receiving and understanding. I don't need to be afraid. God is here. God is with me. I can be courageous. I can believe that I am a warrior. I can believe. But you see, he's not through yet. They come to the second altar. So now God responds by giving him another altar. He says, okay, Gideon, now you're ready. And so now he, he tells him, he says, I want you to go to, tonight. I want you to tear down your father's altar to Baal and the Asherah pole next to it that they worship, these other gods. And I want you to take the bull that is in your father's house. And I want you to tear down and take the wood from the altar that you tore down and make an altar that's proper altar to me and take the bull and sacrifice it on that altar to me. So it says Gideon was afraid, so he did it at night. I still give you know, Gideon a whole lot of applause for doing it at all because this was do or die for him. Now he's ready. Now he offers a kind of altar 
that he knew if he, if he offered this kind of sacrifice, he might die. Here's a definition of surrender. <clears throat> so I said sacrifice is a costly act of giving. Surrender is an open posture of receiving. You hear that? Surrender is an open posture of receiving. We often get to make and put them like they're the same. Like a sacrifice and surrender is the same thing. But a sacrifice is a giving. And when we, when we give to God, God receives. Right? When we surrender, then God gives to us. So we sacrifice in God and we bless God. And then we surrender. And now we say, basically, we, we hold up the red, you know, the, the, the white flag. And we say, no, now God gives to us. And this is, what Je this is what Gideon was doing now. And he's saying, God, I surrender. My life, I surrender my life. I'm going to do this altar. I'm no, long no longer my life anymore. It's all yours. And you know what happens? He does this. He wakes up. And all the townspeople are like, who tore down the Baal? Who tore down the Asherah pole? We're bring him before us. He's going to die today. And, and, th and they find out. They do some investigation. They find out it was Gideon. And, and Gideon, they bring before him. And Gideon, you're going to die. And you know what happens? This guy who needs assurance, who needs encouragement, his dad steps up for him. His dad stands in the gap, puts his arm around Gideon. I just picture this. I love this moment. He's like, all of you, why are you trying to defend Baal? If he's a god, he can defend himself. But anyone who's trying to defend Baal, by the end of today, you're going to die. <laughs> right? And now they're like, so now, now they name, they rename Gideon Jerubael which is the one who contends with Baal, right? And now Gideon, this name goes on from town to town to town until you get to the next part, which is a story we all know. Now Gideon, this warrior, calls everyone to arms, and we're going to fight the Midianites, right? And just the rest of the story is, but, you know, they have like 10,000 men, you know, 20,000 men. They're fighting against 120, 135,000, and God says to them, Gideon, you got too many guys because if you win, they're going to say they did it. Because that's the downward spiral they're just used to, right? Well, we did it. We're just so great, you know. And he, so, so he, he goes through a process of wheedling them down to 300 guys. 300 against 135,000. God's like, all right, I think if they win now, they'll give me the glory, you know, and give me the praise. And so that's kind of the rest of the story. But how do we get there? How do we get to have an altered life where we live in victory, where we're able to not rely on ourselves anymore but give the glory to God it requires us to sacrifice and surrender. To sacrifice and give glory to God and to surrender and allow God to do it for us, with us. To change our belief system that I don't believe anymore. I don't believe anymore that God abandoned me. I believe that, I, that we did some very terrible things and we brought this on ourselves. But what I also believe is that any time I cry out to the Lord, he's ready to answer. And it keeps happening over and over and over again until we come to a cross where God himself sacrifices and surrenders. And he gives us the model by which we should live by. I want to clo close in prayer, and I want you to just bow your head and close your eyes if you would. <clears throat> Some of you today, you, you need to surrender. You've been controlling too many things in your life. You've been doing it your own way, and you keep finding yourself in more than one iteration of coming to a point of frustration and maybe even oppression. And you've cried out to the Lord before, and it's not as though God is not faithful. It's just that you keep doing this. You just keep taking it back. You know? And maybe today is the day that you say, God, I am fully surrendering it to you. That relationship, that situation, your vocation, that thing that's oppressing you, that person, that, that situation, you. Maybe today. Not only do you cry out to the Lord, but you say, God, I'm going to go through a process that alters my life. I'm going to set up my life in such a way that it nurtures your presence, that it nurtures my surrender. 
that it nurtures a kind of sacrifice, sacrificial kind of life, a cruciform kind of life, a life that lives where we are consistently dying to ourselves and consistently living to God. Maybe some of you today, you need to tear down an altar that's in your life, an idol, something you've been putting your money, your time, your energy toward that has been sapping your energy when it really needed to go to God. May have been, may be a good thing, and that's why it's so deceiving for you. But it's an altar, not a proper altar. And maybe you need to tear down that altar and build a new one properly to God, where you would give to God something that costs you something. So, Lord, in the midst of this today, we surrender. We put up the white flag and we say, God, I want you to work through me. I want to make my decision through you. I'm going to trust you. I'm going to believe that you are with me. I don't have to be afraid. I'm going to believe who you said that I am. And, Lord, today, if we don't even know who we are, I just pray that you would send people along in our life to tell us to speak into our lives. You are warrior. You are overcomer. You are one who accomplished this or that. Lord, send people our way. And today, Lord, we are going to live our lives from one altar to the next, from one sacrifice to the next, from one surrender to the next, until you finally rule you finally Lord of our lives fully so that we might be an example to the world that in Jesus Christ there is victory there is transformation there is true change that our lives can be altered for the better Lord we give you ourselves in Jesus name Amen We sing this next song. I just want to remind you that our altars are here at the front. Our kneelers are here at the front. This is a time for us to respond to what the Lord is doing in our life. Would you stand and worship with me? Just want you. And I'm sorry when I've just gone through the motions. I'm sorry when I just sing another song. Take me back to where we started. I open up my heart to you. I'm sorry when I've come with my agenda. I'm sorry when I just thought that you're enough and take me back to where we started. I open up my heart to you. Caught up in your presence.
just for you. Just for you. Nothing else. Nothing else. Nothing else will do. I just want you. Nothing else. Nothing else. Nothing else will do. I just want you. Nothing else. Nothing else, Jesus. Nothing else will do. Nothing else, nothing else will do. Caught up in your presence, I just want to sit here at your feet. Caught up in this holy moment. You don't owe us anything more than anything that you can do. We just want you, we just want you, nothing else, nothing else. Nothing else will do. We just want you. Nothing else. Nothing else, God. Nothing else will do. We just want you. Amen. You guys can have a seat for just a minute. Thank you for staying a little extra today, but we're so excited to welcome to our family officially Jim Keel and his daughter Heather Keel, uh, who have been worshiping with us for a number of months now. And what I love about what Jim has shared, and what Heather and I, uh, as we talked the other day, is it's just just his home. It's a great, great thing. And Jim uh, now is officially, I mean, it, this is a record timing. You're officially on the green shirt crew who fixes everything around here in our, our church. It's amazing. You just jump right in. So we're so grateful that y'all are taking this next step. We welcome you into the life and ministry of this church. And we ask everybody who joins us, will you continue to serve God and support this church through your prayers, presence, gift, service, and witness? They will. And so will you re-up on that commitment as well for all of you who call this church home? Will you support and continue to serve the Lord here with your prayers, presence, gift, service, and witness. Amen. We're all committed together. So let's let's pray for, for you guys. If you'll extend your hand out and welcome them in prayer. Lord, thank you for Jim and Heather and their family and what they mean to us. And we just pray that this step is a, a blessing to you and to us and to them. And Lord, we ask that you would welcome them into this family and uh, help them, Lord, to find their uh, calling and home and the ways that they are taking that step, next steps in your direction through this church. We love you and we thank you for this time together. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Hey guys, welcome them uh, to the to our officially to our family as we go today. We love you and thank you for being here. If you'll help us with the chairs. Uh, and see you next week.